Welcome everyone to this week's Rise and Tide Foundation lecture, where we are continuing our journey into the role of storytellers, literature, and a lot more um, as a gateway and insight into the processes that actually drove world history. And you know, you could get at a study of history in a, in a variety of ways. Most people will start from textbooks that they're given in school, uh, or that they could just buy at a at a local, you know, indigo franchise bookstore or chapters. Um, that's one way to do it, but the insights that one would get into the causal nexus of history, the ideas, the personalities that shaped history, um, which has a very important cultural component, would generally be missed, especially any type of unifying characteristic that would give people an insight into um, something more than just a, a local period in space and time geographically. Um, so this is why we've we've taken the uh, the challenge right now over the course of the last uh, three lectures and which will continue for the next three months into different angles into into this uh, topic of history uh, through the standpoint of literature, but not just history into human nature, into the creative process of the mind since ultimately history is driven by creative ideas and at times, efforts to destroy or subvert the effects of creative ideas um, for reasons which people can, can think about on their own. So today we are very happy to have Adam Sedia, a good friend who has published on uh, the New Liar magazine, on the Rising Tide Foundation site, on the Chain News and many other places, and has published his own books of poetry, which people will be able to uh, purchase by going to the description box of this video. Um, I think a new book, a new uh, collection of poetry is going to be coming online pretty soon. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong about that one, Adam. Uh, that's correct. Good. Um, and, uh, and Adam, does, he wears many hats, one of which is a lawyer and uh, one of which is a storyteller, one of which is a, a poet and probably a family man as well. Uh, so with that, I will uh, leave the stage to you, Adam, to uh, elucidate us into something about Cervantes that many people have not real considered before. Okay, well, thank you for that introduction. And I was excited to be asked to give this lecture. Um, Spain has always been a fascinating place for me. I actually lived there for a few months uh, <clears throat> several years ago. And um, Can you put it on the table? I'm sorry. Oh, and I, I just, I muted somebody. Okay, sorry. Um, and and what, what the focus of this lecture is going to be is not so much the standard interpretations you get of, of Cervantes, where either uh, character studies or, uh, you know, where it fits into the picaresque novel tradition or, or where, how it criticizes medieval romances. Uh, one, the, the famous literary critic Harold Bloom said uh, the novel open is open to endless interpretation. So this is one of them. In my research, I haven't really come across it, but I think the novel lends itself to a very uh, apt analysis of historical criticism in that uh, Cervantes is a crit critic of Spanish society at the time and in particular Spain as a nation that had lost its way by 1605, uh, the year when Don Quixote was published. So what I'm going to do with this lecture is sort of go through Spanish history, how it shaped this into the novel itself and how it criticizes that. And there'll be plenty of detours along the way where we talk about linguistics and, uh, genealogy and things like that. So hopefully it's a fun trip. So where we should begin is the fall of the Roman Empire, but we're going to give go 
back before that and give some more background. Uh, I'm going my first. Um, let me figure out how to do the. Yeah, here we go. This is a, a linguistic map of the Spain before uh, the Roman conquest after the Second Punic War in 201 BC. Uh, you can see there's four main language, five actually. Uh, the Celtic languages is the white uh, Manila color. There's the Iberian languages in uh, red and then uh, you can see the Turditanian in the south, that ancient Tartessian. If you read the Bible and they talk about Tarshish, where King Solomon got his gold from, that's what it was. So there was a long history uh, pre-Roman. Uh, and then the blue areas along the coast were Phoenician colonies that ended up under Carthaginian control. Uh, as I mentioned, Rome took Spain from Carthage and conquered the rest of the country. Uh, so by the fall of the Roman Empire, it had been Roman territory for a good six centuries. And early on, it attracted a lot of colonists from Italy, settlers, and Latin completely displaced the local languages except in the very northeast where you have Basque, uh, which is the only survivor of these ancient languages that's still spoken today. Um, so then, after the fall of the Roman Empire, we have the Visigoths coming in. And what the Goths, the Goths were one of the many Germanic tribes that um, entered the Roman Empire. They had their origin in uh, Scandinavia, in an island that to this day is part of Sweden and is called Gutland or Land of the Goths. Um, and actually another bit of trivia, until 1972, the King of Sweden's official title was King of the Swedes and the Goths. So there's a long historical memory there. By the second century AD, the Goths had migrated to the lower Danube Black Sea area, uh, what is now Romania, Ukraine, that area. Of the century, so we're talking time of Constantine, they split into two tribes in response to the Hunnic invasions. The Ostrogoths or Eastern Goths stayed where they were uh, vassals of the Huns. The Western Goths or Visigoths uh, moved west into the empire, into the Roman Empire. Um, one of their elite chieftains, Alaric, usurped power from the uh, previous uh, rulers in 395, and he demanded that Rome recognize his authority over the Goths and grant him ally status. Well, they didn't really pay attention to him, so he invaded the empire. In 395, he took Athens, and then in, he moved west, and in 410, uh, sacked Rome, which is the first time in more than 800 years a foreign enemy had entered Rome, and it sent shockwaves throughout the world. Uh, it revealed the empire for the weak, decayed society it was, and uh, it... it St. Augustine wrote The City of God in Response, which the medieval mindset arose uh, a lot out of that. It, it was it had a huge cultural impact, as you might imagine. It would be, you know, like a, an enemy sacking New York City or Washington, D.C. today. Well, Alaric got the response he wanted, even though he died only a few months after he sacked Rome. The Western Empire recognized his successors and granted them a strip of land to settle as a kingdom. And that's what you see this uh, bright red here uh, in Aquitaine in southwestern France with the capital at Toulouse. Well, the Visigoths expanded into both France and Spain in the next years. Um, until 507 when King Clovis of the Franks uh, defeated and killed Alaric II, who's under whom the Visigoths had their widest territorial expansion and forced the Visigoths out of what is now France into Spain. 
uh, and they moved their capital to Toledo, just southwest of Madrid. Um, Toledo remains uh, culturally a, a very important center for uh, Spain, and again, because because of its uh, his historic role as capital is is kind of considered the um, the old capital of Spain, um, even though it moved several times afterwards. Um, by 586, the Visigoths had expanded through the whole Spanish uh, peninsula, the whole Iberian peninsula, and ruled it all. Um, by now, however, the Gothic language, they, there weren't very many, the Visigoths weren't very numerous. Uh, they did, had, didn't have a very strong impact either linguistically or genetically on the Spanish. Uh, in fact, the Gothic language uh, was, was dying out by the end of the 6th century. It, it would survive only ceremonially for about another 100 years, but uh, even the Visigothic nobility themselves were speaking the uh, Latin dialect that um, most people in Spain spoke. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the Visigothic language does survive in a lot of personal, Spanish personal names like uh, Fernando, uh, Alfonso, Rodrigo, or Casilda for women. Uh, you can see that uh, those are fairly common names. <laughs> And again, because of the noble status, um, there was a, there's always the desire to emulate nobility. So the, the names got preserved, even though the language didn't. Uh, but, um, even though they're at conception of the Dark Ages, the Visigoths actually did more than any other of the Germanic tribes to preserve the infrastructure of the Roman world they inherited. Uh, they were impressed by the aqueducts and the baths and actually kept them uh, working and operational. And when the Arabs uh, conquered Spain, these had already been preserved and they continued to preserve them. So there was actually a continuity from Roman times through um, Muslim Spain of, uh, of this work, of this Roman infrastructure. And also uh, Saint Isidore of Seville who lived from 560 to 636 is often called the last scholar of the ancient world. Uh, he compiled an encyclopedia of knowledge of the day and is actually the inventor of the period comma and the colon. Uh, interestingly. And again, I Isidore preserved a lot of the knowledge of the day and his works were copied in manuscripts that were preserved through the Middle Ages. So there was a cultural continuity from the classical world here. Um, more to the point of what the lecture is about, the Visigothic, of course, were uh, Germanic and their Germanic customs, and they were the nobility. So their Germanic customs and culture were the law of the land. And, you know, in this proto-Germanic culture, the attainment of honor, fame, recognition was the primary ambition of a man. Uh, independence, individuality, personal honor, uh, were highly emphasized, and the law was based on kinship status, rights, and privileges. Um, in some works, this is called proto-feudal, and indeed the feudal system developed out of this. So this is the mindset that the elite, the rulers of Spain had for these three centuries of Visigothic rule. And another interesting thing, you, there were 33 kings that are listed on the uh, left side of your screen here. The kingship was an elected office by an assembly of the nobles and later the bishops. And um, again, that grew out of the Germanic tribal custom, but it created some problems towards the... Uh, uh, in the late 7th century, towards the end of Visigoth, the families of King Hindaswinth, uh, who you see uh, right here, and of uh, King Wamba. Uh, the, the throne went back and forth with coups and counter-coups. 
until you get to the end, uh, King Witiza, who is from the Wamba family, died, and Roderick, who is from the Hinduswinth family, got himself elected uh, through skullduggery. Well, Witiza's son rose in open rebellion and claimed kingship in the region, what is now Catalonia. So there was a division there. And right now, across the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, there was the newly established uh, caliphate uh, that had antic very recently and they took advantage of that and invaded Spain. The, the traditional story is that there was a Count Julian uh, whose daughter Roderick had seduced and to get personal revenge he invited uh, the Muslims to invade. Uh, there, there's no historical proof for or against that, but it's been the subject of many operas and poems and dramas throughout the years. Uh, uh, the, the lady's name was Florinda, so if you ever run across that, that's what that legend references. Uh, but anyway, the leader of the first uh, expeditionary force was Tariq ibn Ziyad, the governor of Tangier, who with a force of only 1,700 men uh, met Rod King Roderick in battle and killed him. And without a leader, uh, the Visigoths sort of fell into disorganization and then Tariq's superior, uh, Musa ibn Nusayr, uh, led a larger force of 12, again, only 12,000, and within five years, they had conquered all of the Iberian Peninsula. And as we all know, they would advance further into France until their defeat by Charles Martel at Poitiers. But that wasn't the end. Um, the Visigothic nobles who managed to survive fled north now we think of Spain as a dry country where they have uh, palm trees and olive trees growing. That's true for most of Spain, but the north along the Bay of Biscay is very mountainous and very rainy. It has a weather that resembles sort of uh, Ireland, uh, not tip what you would expect of what our typical image is of Spain. But there is a region sort of in the middle of that coast there called Asturias. And that's where the noblemen fled, and they elected Roderick's cousin Pelagius, or in Spanish, Don Pelayo, as their king. Immediately, he refused to pay the jizya tax uh, to the Muslim leaders that was imposed on non-Muslims. And a Muslim force was sent against him, and he defeated it at Covadonga in 718. Covadonga, for the Spanish, has the same... Uh, impact as uh, the Battle of Poitiers does to the rest of Europe. Uh, it, it, it signaled the end of the Muslim advance and the beginning of what would be called what would become the Reconquista or the reconquest of Spain. Uh, it would be a nearly 800 year process uh, of the Christians in the north uh, retaking control of Spain and driving out Muslim rule. So before I go into what the Reconquista actually was, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Muslim Spain. Uh, as I mentioned, the, it was conquered in the name of the unified caliphate that at the time was ruled by the Umayyad family out of Damascus. Um, The, um, and in 750, only uh, 34 years after the Muslim conquest was complete, there was the coup by the distantly related Abbasid family that overthrew the Umayyads and killed every last one of them except one who managed to escape, fled across Syria, Egypt, North Africa, and ended up in Spain where he gathered supporters and declared himself emir his name was abdul rahman and he declared himself emir uh, which was a secular title as opposed to caliph which is both secular and religious uh defeated the abbasid forces that were sent against him and set up an independent uh, muslim state in spain 
under the old Umayyad dynasty continuing. So uh, the, the Emirate of Cordoba is, is today is, has a reputation of being a center of art and culture and learning, which it definitely was. But the motivation for that was uh, Abdul Rahman and his successors wanted to create a court that would rival the Abbasid court at Baghdad for, for its opulence and its learning. So he sent scholars and imported books from both Baghdad and Constantinople uh, to set up this center in a good uh, three centuries. Uh, you'll notice on the map on the right, uh, that lists major Reconquista victories with the city in the year it was captured. You'll notice only three cities in the very northwest uh, date from a time when the Umayyad dynasty was ruling at Cordoba. That's because there was a unified Islamic state uh, that uh, was able to fend off uh, advances from the north. However, the last Umayyad was overthrown in 1031 uh, by a literal oligarchy. And then Muslim Spain was divided into city-states called taifas. And the map on the left shows the various taifas along with the Christian kingdoms in the north. And you can see there's probably a good two dozen taifas. And although they were culturally advanced, they were militarily weak and could not stand up to the Christian advance the same way uh, the unified Umayyad Caliphate could. Oh, and when I do say Caliphate, the Umayyad emirs by 929 had felt strong enough to assume the religious title Caliph. So they set up a rival uh, claim to the Abbasids to be the successors of Muhammad. Uh, and they weren't the only ones at the time. So now let's turn our focus to the Christian kingdoms at the north and, and what actually happened during the Reconquista. So the first incursion into Muslim Spain actually came from Charlemagne in France. Um, the Basque region in the northeast of the Iberian Peninsula was kind of a no man's land and they had made incursions into Aquitaine. So uh, Charlemagne sent military action south of the Pyrenees, and they actually conquered, by 806, they had conquered most of northeast Spain, uh, including Pamplona. At the same time, between conquered uh, what a, was what is now is Catalonia, the, the um, in, in, including Barcelona, which fell to Charlemagne in 801, and that was incorporated into his empire as the Spanish March. Uh, in 824, uh, in the Basque no man's land, which still existed, the a noble named Inigo Arista uh, was elected king and called his kingdom Navarre. Uh, it would last until Spain annexed it in 1513. Uh, but after the 11th century, it really had no importance. It was just confined to a local state. Um, part of Navarre, uh, they, one of the kings of Navarre made his illegitimate son Count of Aragon in the east. And that son ended up declaring himself king. And the kingdom of Aragon grew out of that. And it actually became quite a powerful state, one of the two kingdoms that would unite to form Spain. They, by marriage, they acquired the, the Spanish March of Catalonia. Uh, by papal decree, they acquired Sardinia. And then by marriage again, they acquired Naples and Sicily. So that by the 15th century, Aragon had a sort of maritime empire in the Western Mediterranean. And because it had possessions in Italy, it adopted Renaissance culture much earlier than the rest of uh, Western Europe did outside of Italy. Um, back to Asturias though, which was the original 
kingdom. In 856, they conquered the city of uh, Legio, which was the Latin name. In Spanish, it's known as Leon. Uh, they transferred their capital at their 910 and renamed it the Kingdom of Leon. The region in the east of that kingdom was the county of uh, Castile. It was in Spanish, it's Castilla, uh, but we in English we say Castile. It became an independent kingdom, and then in 1230, King Ferdinand III of Castile inherited both Castile and Leon and merged the two kingdoms. Uh, Ferdinand III actually made the most extensive uh, Reconquista gains. Uh, he conquered the old Muslim capital of Cordoba in 1236. Murcia in 1243, which gave, extended Castile to the Mediterranean and divided the Muslim lands in two, um, Murcia being right here. And then uh, he most famously, he conquered Seville, the most populous city in the south in 1248. That left only Granada, south of Seville, as the remaining Muslim state surviving in Spain. Uh, and in fact, uh, Ferdinand III was later canonized a saint. Um, and then just for completeness's sake, uh, when Porto along the coast, uh, its Latin name was Portus Cale, so it was count, uh, conquered in uh, 868 and named the County of Portugal. In 1139, it its Count Alfonso Enriquez, who was a member of the French royal family, was proclaimed king and then conquered Lisbon four years later. So by the 13th century, you had uh, four Christian kingdoms. You had Aragon, Navarre, Castile and Leon united, and then Portugal. So a bit about, let me exit here, Reconquista culture. Uh, it can, again, the many, the original no, nobility of the kingdom of Asturias and Leon were descendants of the Visigothic nobility. So they continued that Germanic tradition of uh, personal honor and, and, and a code that emphasized kinship and property. And this developed into high feudal culture that was common over the rest of Europe. Now, the nobility in medieval Spain were called Hidalgos, uh, which is the subtitle of Don Quixote, El Imperioso Hidalgo. And uh, it actually comes from the Latin word Italicus or Italian, uh, which meant that it was someone with full Roman citizens rights. Uh, in the Visigothic era, this meant that he was a freeman uh, with the right to wear arms and was exempt from taxation. Now, originally, the Reconquista, they, they, the Christian forces were going to take anyone they could get. So anyone, any man who could provide a, a mounted uh, military service was automatically considered an Hidalgo. So if you owned a heart horse, uh, armor, and, and a sword, you were automatically a, a nobleman. Um, and it wasn't closed. Now, granted, in those days, all those items were very expensive, so you had to be a person of means to have that, but there wasn't any uh, kinship restriction on that really until the 12th century. Uh, another interesting part of this is as the Christian forces advanced, many of the Muslim population abandoned their lands, and there was a need to repopulate them. So, in effect, these Spain was repopulated from the north, and these took the forms of granting land grants to peasants. And then for the towns, uh, the kings would grant charters to the towns that exempted them from uh, loyalty to any nobleman and made them subject to the crown directly. And these were called fueros, and they made Spain a famously decentralized monarchy as opposed to uh, the rest of Europe, even going into the 19th century. Um, the rights of fueros were jealously held and, and they, there was a segment of the population who wanted to preserve them well into the 19th and 20th centuries.
So, of course, uh, this, this feudal culture of valor was reflected in the literature of the day. And, the, of course, the most famous uh, piece of literature dealing with the Reconquista is uh, El Cantar de Miocid, or Miocid, if we're going to talk in Iberian Spanish. Um, it tells the story of Ruy Diaz de Vivar, uh, who was an, a knight who lived from 1043 to 1099. His name, El Cid, comes from Arabic Said, which means Lord. Uh, because he lent his services out to both Christian and Muslim rules at, rulers at the time. Uh, he's also called in the, in the poem El Campeador, the champion. His most famous deed was conquering Valencia from the Muslims in uh, 1094. And uh, the poem that was written about him was originally transmitted orally, and uh, it it was discovered in uh, as a manuscript, and it's uh, the Chanson de Blanc is the national poem of France, or uh, Beowulf is considered the old English epic. So I'm just going to show you, I'm not going to read this. Uh, this is actually the poet W.S. Merwin's translation of the poem. I have the original on the left and the translation on the right. Um, Spanish, like the other Romance languages, evolved much more slowly than English did over the course of time. So an, a reader of modern Spanish would be perfectly comfortable reading this medieval Spanish, uh, much more so than, say, a modern high school student would be comfortable reading Chaucer. Uh, there's certainly much fewer footnotes would be needed. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to some of the archaisms, because again, these will pop up in Don Quixote. So on the bottom, there's some vocabulary. Um, there, there was a vowel shift in, in Spanish, much like there was in English. So where, where you have an accented O, it becomes, it, becomes a diphthong ue so we have full in medieval becomes fue um and then we have orthographical differences the the most important one is the medieval x which made a, a sh sound um fell out of the spanish um language in the middle ages uh it, 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 where it appeared in words, it, it was replaced by J, uh, the jota, the H sound. And you can see it here where they have uh, dejadas. Uh, it, it, in modern Spanish, it would be dejadas from dejar, to leave, to leave behind. Um, the, the QU becomes CU, the, the CEDIL is lost. Uh, the V becomes a B in the imperfect endings. Uh, and interestingly, a lot of these archaic forms still survive in Portuguese. Uh, Spanish and Portuguese evolved from the same dialect of Latin, and Portuguese is much more conservative, uh, to the point they even preserve the X in words like uh, chadres or xicara, uh, which in Spanish have fallen out of use. And then the, they also preserve the F, in the initial F in many words. Uh, like uh, in, in the word son, filio in Portuguese from Latin filius. In Spanish, um, the initial F was dropped to the silent H, so it's hijo in Spanish. Uh, there, there was less preservation there, more evolution. And just a, a, a side note here, when I say Spanish, if you go to Spain, there is no such thing as the Spanish language. And that is because multiple languages are spoken there. Um, you, you have... Uh, Asturian and Aragonese, which are closely related. Um, you have Galician or Gallego in the northwest, which is related to Portuguese. You have Catalan in Catalonia, which is related to the Languedoc of southern France. And then you have Basque in uh, the northeast, which is the only surviving remnant of the pre-Latin languages. So 
what we call Spanish is called Castilian, Castellano, because it's the dialect spoken in the kingdom of Castile. Uh, and even in South America, Spanish is called Castellano instead of Espanol. Uh, so just a little linguistic note there. So the Reconquista finally came to an end in 1492, which was really a seminal year for the formation of the Spanish nation. Uh, 23 years previously, uh, when King Henry IV of Castile died without an heir, the male line was extinct, so his sister Isabella became Queen of Castile. She married King Ferdinand II of Aragon, which united the two largest and most powerful kingdoms on the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, but they, it was just a joint union at that point. It, was, it hadn't been officially united. On January 2nd, 1492, uh, Granada at last fell. It was the last Muslim city to fall. And that ended the 800-year uh, Reconquista process. March 31st followed, and that was the Alhambra decree. Uh, the Alhambra being the... Uh, former Arab palace in uh, Granada that Ferdinand and Isabella used throughout 1492. Uh, the first part of the Alhambra decree was that Castile and Aragon were former, formally united in a, in, a, in a kingdom called Spain uh, from the Latin word Hispania, which was the, the Roman name for the, the area. The second thing it did was it ordered the expulsion of all Jews and Muslims who did not convert, and then it established the Inquisition. Uh, what the Inquisition was, it was born out of paranoia. It was There was a fear of a Muslim invasion and, and fear of local uh, converts not really converting and working with the enemy, so the Inquisition was established to monitor them. Uh, in reality, it was no different than what Queen Elizabeth was doing in England at the time or, you know, really any of the other uh, nations at the time with this established religion, which, which was everything. And as we all know, on August 3rd of 1492, Columbus departed with his ships. And as we... We all know the myth uh, that people thought the earth was flat. Well, not only did they know the earth was round, they knew how big it was. And the fear, the fear was, was that if you sailed west, you would run out of supplies and die before you ever reached Asia. So Columbus, who had that idea, was denied funding time and again. But uh, Ferdinand and Isabella figured this was a project worth throwing money at because the Portuguese had already rounded Africa and reached India to bypass the Venetian monopoly on luxury goods. So Ferdinand and Isabella figured what the heck it's worth trying. Well, Columbus ran into a whole new world. And it was almost fortuitous in an unfortunate way because the very year that the Reconquista ended, Spain was brought into contact with a non-Christian hostile population. So the energy and the mindset that had driven the Reconquista was transferred to the New World. Um, you had the settlement of Hispaniola, Cuba, and Puerto Rico by Columbus himself starting in 1493. In 1510, the mainland was settled for the first time at Panama. Then in 1521, you had Cortez's conquest of Mexico, which was famously brutal. And in 1532, you had Pizarro's conquest of Peru, uh, which in both cases, it was almost fortuitous. Peru, the Inca Empire extended from Ecuador down to Chile. It, it covered a wide range of territory. It was well organized. And Pizarro with his ragtag band were only able to defeat it because there had been a civil war between two brothers over the succession to the throne. It was 
it, it was one of the most unexpected victories at the time and it and it between Mexico and Peru, it brought Spain an empire that stretched across two continents. Um, interestingly enough, by 1565, when Spain uh, settled the Philippines, uh, there was an official regret as to, to the, the brutality and the bloodiness of the conquests of Mexico and Peru. And there was a conscious effort to make that colonization more peaceful. It was done under the guise of a religious conversion rather than an outright conquest. And, and it was indeed more peaceful. So 40 years before Don Quixote, there was already uh, a sense of regret uh, as official Spanish policy of its uh, previous conquests. The New World was pretty much conquered by the middle of the 16th century, but there was still one more opportunity for the Reconquista, the Spain of the Reconquista to surface. And I'm going to go backtrack a little bit back to Ferdinand and Isabella and their family. Give me just a minute. So Ferdinand and Isabella were the first two monarchs of a united Spain, but they had no, well, they had a son. None of their sons survived childhood. They had three daughters who survived to adulthood, uh, the youngest of whom was Henry VIII's first wife. But the eldest was married to the son of the Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian I of the House of Habsburg. Uh, he died before both Maximilian and Ferdinand, but their son uh, inherited both thrones in, well, more than one throne in Spain and the Holy Roman Empire, along with uh, several Italian and Dutch lands, and that was in Spain, he was Charles I. In the empire, he was Charles V. And he was Europe's most powerful monarch for 40 years. Now, among his realms were the uh, what were called the Burgundian Low Countries, or you know, the Netherlands. Uh, he inherited those from his paternal grandmother, Mary of Burgundy. And it's, it's actually an interesting story. Story, how the House of Burgundy acquired those. It, it's a case. But what was happening at this time was the Reformation. Uh, and Calvinism spread from Geneva down the Rhine into the, the Netherlands. And while the, uh, the richer south, the counties of Flanders and Brabant and Antwerp, what is today Belgium, uh, remained Catholic, in the north, Calvinism began taking over. Uh, and Calvinism, it's hard to imagine a more diametrically opposed uh, theology or practice to Catholicism than Calvinism. It, it was it was quite different and the the main uh the main point of contention was the calvinist belief that depictions of saints and the virgin and artwork was idolatry so you had outbursts of uh destruction iconoclasm destruction of holy images in churches and that prompted a response now Charles the the first the fifth in 1556 abdicated after he couldn't enforce religious uniformity in his German realms and he divided his realms he gave his uh, German realms to his brother Ferdinand uh, who had who was married to the heiress of the thrones of Bohemia and Hungary as well to his son Philip the second however he gave Spain <laughs> his Italian realms and his Dutch realms. And, and Philip was a very staunch and very militant Catholic. And he responded heavy handedly to the iconoclastic outbursts. In uh, 1566, he sent his right hand man, the uh, notoriously iron fisted Duke of Alba to suppress the, the, rebel the religious rebellion there. 
And in 1568, the seven northern provinces of the Netherlands responded by declaring themselves independent. Uh, after a few years of searching for a monarch, nobody would accept. So the, the assembly, the states general, decided they would govern it as a republic. And it became one of the first federal republics in the world. Um, that led to what was called the 80 Years War. Uh, it was the war, essentially the war of independence for the northern provinces of the Netherlands. And for the few, first few years, it was absolutely a bloodbath. It was brutal uh, on both sides. And again, what fueled the Spanish brutality was again, the Reconquista mindset. Here, here was an enemy, instead of a, an infidel, it was now a heretic. And there, there was the, it was, it was a war for king, for country, and for God. Uh, but it didn't, I won't say it was a complete failure because Spain retained the Southern Netherlands for another 200 years. Uh, but by 1585, the Northern provinces were de facto independent. And by Cervantes's time, there was a lull in the fighting and then an actual truce starting in 1609. Now, now in 1621, the Thirty Years' War would reignite the conflict and it wouldn't be officially settled until 1648 with the Treaty of Westphalia. But that's where we were. So uh, by Cervantes' time, by the publication of Don Quixote, Spain Spain has had the Reconquista uh, in the new part of the 16th century. Um, there's nowhere else to apply it. And Spain as a military power is spent. And, you know, as the next slide will show, it, it's uh, entering a period of stagnation and decline. So these are the successors of Charles I in Spain, uh, three Philips. As you can see, Spain had a vast, and you'll notice Portugal, Brazil, and its colonies are included. That's because in uh, 1580, Philip II inherited the Portuguese throne as well. So the two kingdoms were briefly united until 1640 when the Portuguese nobles rebelled, uh, declared the Duke of Braganza their king and Spain couldn't stop them. Uh, so you'll also see the uh, inbreeding becomes apparent by the end of the dynasty. Um, you can ask me about that after the presentation if you want. It's, uh, it's past Cervantes' time. But the 17th century for Spain uh, was, like I said, a period of stagnation, decline. And while it was the territorially and the most powerful nation in Europe, it had a, a, medieval, a medieval administration that had never been updated and was still being governed as, as a medieval kingdom, especially when you had changes such as Louis XIV centralizing the royal power in France, not all of which was good, by the way, or you had the English Civil War with the limitations on royal authority imposed there. Spain was still stuck uh, at least two centuries in the past. <laughs> So that's where we are when Don Quixote is published. So let's talk a little bit about Cervantes himself. Um, he was, by the way, there's really no confirmed portraits of Cervantes. This is what is considered the most likely portrait, but again, it's, it's not a, 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 sure, a sure portrait. Uh, he was born... September 29th, 1547, in a town uh, just southeast of Madrid. Um, 
his father was a barber and a surgeon, which at the time was the same profession. Uh, his paternal grandfather, though, was a lawyer who was from Cordoba originally uh, and had settled outside of Madrid. In 1569, an arrest warrant was issued for him for dueling, so he fled Spain to Rome uh, to Cardinal Aquaviva, who had been the papal legate in Spain and worked as a secretary for him. Then when the Holy League was put together, he went to Naples, which was part of the Spanish crown at the time, and hoping to uh, get the arrest warrant expunged, uh, entered the naval service. And he actually fought at the Battle of Lepanto in 1571, which destroyed the Turkish naval fleet. However, in 1575, he was a prisoner of the Turks in Constantinople. Uh, forced to do manual labor, but in 1580 he was ransomed by uh, the the Order of the Barefoot Trinitarians, which was an order of nuns that raised fund to pay ransom for uh, captives that were being held. Uh, 1584 he married. Uh, that was a year after he had an illegitimate daughter with a married woman. Uh, that was, he and the mother concealed that. Uh, I guess they led her to believe the husband was the real father. In 1587, he entered government service first as a purchasing agent and as a tax collector, lived in Seville for a little, and then he died in Madrid in 1616. Uh, he has kind of an interesting literary career, which tells the story of the city of Numantia, which resisted uh, the Roman conquerors and e even to this day is uh, a symbol of Spanish uh, national pride. He also wrote a pastoral romance, La Galatea, and other poems. Uh, his sonnets are actually considered his finest poetic work. And then... Starting in 1585, for 20 years, he published nothing. And then in 1605, part one of Don Quixote appears. Uh, and it captured the popular imagination right away. Uh, he published part two 10 years later. And then in the last three years of his life, he published uh, probably, well, two of his better known works, uh, the exemplary novels, uh, the Viaje del Parnaso, and then uh, another novel which was published posthumously. Uh, that one is not as well received as Don Quixote. So now a little bit about the work of Don Quixote itself. I mean, it, it's, it's highly influential in that it's considered the first true modern novel. Um, it, it's Siri, it's series of episodic portrayals uh, influenced uh, Dumas, Three Musketeers, Mark Twain's uh, Huckleberry Finn, and then uh, Edmond Rostand's Cyrano de Bergerac. And then it has a huge impact in the popular imagination. It's the origin of our word quixotic uh, or the term Lothario uh, for a, a man who seduces women. That comes from one of the stories Don Quixote is reading in the novel. And then the term tilting at windmills from the most famous episode in the book where uh, Don Quixote imagines, sees these windmills and imagines their giants and starts jousting with them and it doesn't end well for him so what i want to do is sort of dive into the novel and show uh, I, i'll assume some basic familiarity with the story um but really the opening lines tell it all they give a good So what I'm going to read to you is uh, the opening lines. Uh, this is the 1885 translation of John Ormsby, 
which I don't particularly like, but it's in the public domain and I didn't have time to translate it myself. So in a village of La Mancha, the name of which I have no desire to call to mind, there lived not long since one of those gentlemen that kept a lance in the lance rack, an old buckler, a lean hack, and a greyhound for coursing, an olla of rather more beef than mutton, a salad on most nights, scraps on Saturdays, lentils on Fridays, and a pigeon or so extra on Sundays, made away with three quarters of his income. The rest of it went in a doublet of fine cloth and velvet breeches and shoes to match for holidays, while on weekdays he made a brave figure in his best homespun. He had in his house a housekeeper past 40, a niece under 20, and a lad for the field and marketplace who used to saddle the hack as well as handle the billhook. The age of this gentleman of ours was boring on 50. He was of a hearty habit, spare, gaunt featured, a very early riser and a great sportsman. They will have it his surname was Quijada or Quesada, for here there is some difference of opinion among the authors who write on the subject. Although from reasonable conjectures, it seems plain that he was called Quejada. This, however, is but little importance to our tale. It will be enough not to stray a hair's breadth from the truth of it in the telling of it. You must know then that the above named gentleman, wherever he was at leisure, which was mostly all the year round, gave himself up to reading books of chivalry with, with such ardor and avidity that he almost entirely neglected the pursuit of his field sports and even the management of his property. And to such a pitch did his eagerness and infatuation go that he sold many an acre of tillage land to buy books of chivalry to read and brought home as many of them as he could get. So what the theme of the book is, is this... Um, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kehara uh, reads these medieval romances, is essentially driven mad by them and imagines himself to be a knight errant or a traveling knight who lends his service to whoever will hire him and goes on adventures of chivalry uh, and the the main source of satire is that you have the the contrast between what uh Kehana's fantasy is and what the reality is um don quixote as he calls himself he's he believes himself to be a valiant knight but he's past 50 and lanky and awkward uh, he takes as his squire a simple farmer, Sancho Panza, whose last name means belly, uh, who's a short, squat figure, uh, not what a knight in training is uh, imagined to be. For his horse, he has, uh, he names his, his horse Rocinante, which comes from the word Rothin, or a, a workhorse. But it the novel says that uh, Quixote compares the horse to uh, Bucephalus, which was Alexander the Great's horse, or Babieca, which was El Cid's horse. And then, of course, he has, as a chivalrous knight, he has the lady love. And for this, he picks uh, a, a lady, a farm girl, who he calls Dulcinea. And then the first episode where he ventures forth, he's at an inn and he imagines the inn to be a castle, and he imagines the innkeeper to be its lord. And there's a bunch of prostitutes that hang out there, and he imagines them to be the ladies in waiting. And then, of course, there's the episode where he believes the windmills to be giants. So you have the reality of the world of that Quixote actually lives in, and then you have Quixote's fantasy that he sees the world to be. Before we go on to the implications of that, there's, I also want to discuss the archaisms uh, in the work. Uh, you'll notice uh, there's that X, the medieval X appearing in the name uh, Quejana takes. Now, the translation inserts an X, but you can see in the original Spanish, there's no X in his name, Quijada, Quesada, or Quejana. It's always J and S, which were current uh, 
Spanish sounds at the time. But Quixote intentionally adapts well, what would be pronounced in medieval Spanish Quixote uh, as an archaic name. And the dialogue, uh, Quixote talks in archaic medieval Spanish, which again was much closer to the Spanish of his day uh, than let's say Chaucer's English would be to even the English of the, of the 17th century. Um, but and in translations, it's often translated into King James Bible type English, or I think some translations even use Chaucerian English for it. But, you know, you can see, O Senora de la Fermosura, there's the F that in modern Spanish would be the silent H, Hermosuro. Uh, Esfuerzo y vigor del debilitado. Corazón mío, and again, mío, it'd be mi corazón in, in modern Spanish. That's kind of a, a florid way of expressing it. And you can see the reflection in the translation. Oh, lady of beauty, strength and support of my fair heart, it is time for thee to turn the eyes of thy greatness on thy captive knight, on the brink of so mighty an adventure. Um, I think that King Jamesy type English does a good job of capturing the archaism in Quixote's speech. Um, and again, we have here, uh, Pero de vosotros so eci baja canalla, no hago caso alguno. Tirad, llegad, venid y ofendedme en cuanto pudieredes. Uh, que vosotros veréis el pago que lleváis de vuestra sandez y demasía. So, and we have use of the, the uh, familiar second person plural, uh, but it's being used towards a single person, which is, again, an archaic, highly formal usage at this time. And the form uh, pudieredes uh, is an archaism, uh, Pudieres would be the, the modern Spanish rendition, and, and it's, it, it's a, a form of the imperfect subjunctive that's not commonly used either. Um, th this is a highly uh, affected, archaicized dialogue. Um, and, and you can see again, it reflected somewhat in the translation. I don't think this translation quite captures the archaism uh, as well as the previous one. So what what does Cervantes do with the character of Don Quixote? Um, I, I, my reading of it is that Don Quixote represents the Spain of Cervantes's day. It was backward looking, it was deliberately archaic, uh, and it didn't have a grasp of the changes that were going on in the world around it. Uh, it was living in a fantasy world. Uh, and by portraying Quixote that way, it's, it, it's a criticism of the Spanish world. And all of Quixote's adventures, things don't go well for him. Uh, you know, particularly with the windmills, he gets injured, he gets humiliated. Um, there's an episode where uh, all of his friends can't stand him. There's an episode where the priest comes into his library and starts burning his books because they've driven him mad. Um, but at the end of the novel has an interesting ending. Um, one of the men from the town poses as the Knight of the White Moon and, and offers to meet him in battle, which of course the aging Quixote loses. And according to the rules of chivalry, uh, Quixote must submit to the, the knight's demands, which, are, uh, which he was put up to, to make, which is that he has to cease uh, chivalry and return to his home for one year, which he does. Uh, and then while he's on his deathbed, he regains his sanity. He apologizes for the harm he caused. And uh, he makes his will, which disinherits his niece if she ever marries a man who reads books of chivalry. So what Cervantes does with this ending, I think, is saying that um, 
you know, a society that has reached the point where it can't uh, exist in the world around it is doomed. And the best it can do is to make peace with itself uh, and give, you know, give instructions for posterity to do better, uh, which is what Quixote does here. This is where, you know, I could go into many other details, what, what did happen in Spain afterwards, um, you know, was there a, uh, did, did they come to terms with their uh, loss of their place in the world? Um, but I'll just end there. I, I think now would be a good time to open it up to discussion. Okay. Yeah, that's great. Um, thank you so much, Adam. And, and yeah, your, your approach of, con I love context. Context is, is everything for me. So you did, you went above and beyond my expectations. Thank you so much for that approach. Um, anybody who has a question, I didn't uh, think to, to remind people to put your names in the, uh, the chat box queue to be called upon. Uh, but now's a great time. If anybody has a thought uh, to share or question, uh, Go for it. I, I, I'm sure Bob uh, might have a, a thought or two. Oh, Stephen yeah, got, got his name in on the uh, the list first. So Stephen, go for it. Okay, thanks. Uh, Adam, thanks for a, a wonderful lecture. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, at one point in there, you kind of cued us to bring up the topic of the inbreeding within the Spanish um, uh, aristocracy. I think it was Charles II. Uh, just as a, a quick background on another lecture that Martin Seif did here, he uh, talked about the thesis or the theory that uh, Shakespeare was an artificial persona um, created for Philip Marlowe, if I've got the name right. So we get into the whole establishment, false personas. Uh, when I think of bloodlines and interbreeding, I think of a, a very narcissistic uh, aristocracy and elite, you know, can't have inferior blood and all that sort of stuff. Um, so I was hoping you could just expand upon that, but with the added question, uh, there's obviously the Habsburg chin in there. Do you recognize that in any American political actors, uh, past or present? Ooh, let me think about the second part, but no, the, the Habsburg intermarriage, it, it wasn't, it wasn't so much about elitism as it was about paranoia. Uh, there was, there was a proverb, um, from the time it said, other nations make war, thou fair Austria uh, givest in marriage, um, which meant that the Habsburgs had acquired their empire through advantageous marriage connections. Um, they had acquired the Netherlands, uh, Naples, Sicily, Spain, Hungary, Bohemia, all through these marriages with the, the last female representative of royal lines. So they were afraid of losing that empire through marriage connections if it died out. So they would only marry their daughters off to other members of the House of Habsburg. The science of genetics not being come up with yet, they didn't understand the consequences of that. So you had... Um, Charles the Charles the first was married. His son Philip married his niece uh, uh, from the Austrian line. Philip the third married the most distant, his second cousin. Uh, Philip the fourth married first his double cousin. And I'm sorry, he he married first his cousin who had married out into the French royal family, and then he married his niece who was originally intended for. Uh, his son who had died, but without a male heir, Philip married his niece himself. And that was Charles II, who is in Spain, he is called El Rey Echizado or the Cursed King, because they believed his genetic defects were the result of a curse that was placed on him. And uh, he could, he had the famous Habsburg chin, uh, and it was so bad that his teeth couldn't meet and he was unable to chew. He had an oversized tongue and wasn't able to speak until he was, you know, I think 10 years old. He couldn't walk until he was in his teens. No one expected him to survive, but by some miracle, he lived to be 40. And the, his 35 years of ruling 
was really the greatest period of decline in Spain because it was essentially ruled by uh, his mother and her advisors and there were all sorts of feuds and factions among the court nobility and the work of government wasn't getting done. So when he died, actually he had designated a, his his sister married her uncle and, and there was it, it, there was like two more uncle niece marriages uh, and, and he had designated that line to be his heir but the, his successor died a year before he did and that threw the succession wide open and that was the famous war of the Spanish succession which was really the first world war because it was fought in the colonies as well. Uh, and that resulted in the House of Bourbon being placed on the grandson of Louis XIV being placed on the Spanish throne as Philip V. And what that did was uh, they brought French administrative and cultural ideas with them. And that really injected uh, lifeblood into the Spanish economy. They did away with the medieval structure of the Spanish state and made Spain a, a modern central, modern for the time, centralized administrative state. Uh, but that also led to resentment because you had those fueros I mentioned, which uh, the, the municipalities wanted to preserve their traditional rights and didn't want to be subject to a uniform uh, system. So that's where the inbreeding of Habsburg comes in. And as, as for the Habsburg jaw, I, I, is there someone you had in mind? I, I can't think of anyone right away. Uh, John Kerry has a rather prominent uh, jaw. Oh, uh, yes, yes, he does. Yes. So I've, I've always kind of wondered uh, if there was and, any... And uh, his wife is Portuguese. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and we get into, I, I don't want to get into the whole, uh, uh, her prior husband, but uh, <laughs> it's stuff that Matt would probably be very familiar with, Matt and Cynthia. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. Absolutely. Um, no, but by the way, Stephen, I, I, I haven't thought about this ever so uh in a private message to me later on you could you could throw a thought or two uh my way i'm i, I really like my heinz ketchup though so please don't, don't break, <laughs> don't break my love for heinz ketchup <laughs> um ian i know you've been waiting for a while yes thank you adam for this uh this presentation i'm listening to it from spain so it's uh the context is always very, very interesting uh, the question I had is that Don Quixote was uh, therefore the first uh, novel or modern novel written. What impact did it have on society, on the Spanish society and maybe wider? That, that's a hard question to answer. I, I don't think the impact was very much uh, political as it was cultural. It, it became... A, a, I hate using the word icon, you know, it sounds very poppy, but it, it became a cultural icon almost immediately. Um, I read uh, at the coronation of Philip IV, which was after Cervantes died, there were uh, plays and people dressed up as characters from the novel. So it was a hit um, right away. And, and like I said, the, the imagery, the stories, entered the popular imagination. Um, you know, like I said, with I, I don't think there's an equivalent term uh, like quixotic or tilting at windmills in, in Spanish, uh, but certainly uh, there's a, um, you know, in, as you know, as you probably see in Spain, you, you can't go anywhere in La Mancha without seeing some reference where X episode took place. This is where Cervantes did Y. Um, it, it's, I would say its main impact is just being a, a beloved work uh, uh, that was wide, whose references were widely understood. 
I know that was kind of long-winded. <laughs> hey, thank you. I've got a quick question. Um, you mentioned quickly that there were 20 plays uh, that Cervantes had written. Um, his life obviously overlaps the life of Shakespeare a bit, and they died the same day. And, and I was surprised to discover that a few months ago. And I was wondering if there was anything that you knew about the content of these plays. I, I think the actual full plays themselves have been maybe lost a bit to the Santa time, but do you know anything about the content uh, that's may have been preserved? It, would, would, would he have been? I, I have that? them right here. Oh, okay. The so original. they were not lost. Okay, cool. No. Can you say anything about the plays? Um, there, there's a, a few longer ones that are, um, I, I actually, I, I think the sh shorter plays are much better they're 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 little um i would almost call them farces uh they're divorce judge uh yes they did have those things in 17th century spain you know it 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 goes into humorous episodes about you know unhappy marriages and things like that the longer plays are kind of they're I wouldn't say they rise to the level of a, um, a Calderon or a Tirso de Molina. They're, they're very formalistic. Um, but the, uh, the, the shorter plays are, are a delight to read. They're very humorous. Cool. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to pick up a copy. Uh, Cynthia had a question as well. Her, her mic is busted on her computer, so she just wrote it to me, asked me if I could read it to you. Um, <laughs> She wants to know if, um, uh, hold on one second, let me just get it. Ah, uh, okay, so did uh, Cervantes have an effect on the language like the work of Dante did and Boccaccio for Italian? So did Cervantes's work also uplift and unify the language uh, in a similar way? Uh, no. Um, that is the short answer. Uh, the, the Spanish, Dante wrote at a time where, uh, well, okay, so Dante wrote at a time when in, in Italy, we tend to call them dialects, uh, but they were really separate languages. Uh, the, uh, linguists classify them as their own languages. There was Sicilian, Neapolitan, uh, Roman, Tuscan, um, Lombard, Venetian, Ligurian, those were the main ones, Sardinian. Um, and there was no unified Italian language. Uh, and what Dante did was he sort of invented a language. He took some of the uh, Sicilian uh, from the earlier um, poets uh, from the court of Frederick II who had invented the sonnet. He used his own native Tuscan uh, dialect as the basis for it. And he sort of constructed a language that was, had, did not exist outside of him. And at his time, the, the Italian languages were regarded as um, pigeons, sort of, as vernacular, as bad Latin that the uneducated spoke, proper educated people spoke Latin. Uh, so there was room for Dante to do that. Uh, the language was in a state of flux where Dante could create his own language and transform a despised vernacular into uh, a literary language. By Cervantes's day, uh, the Spanish language had been uh, codify. In fact, there, there's what's called the, and not many languages have this. I know French does, uh, but there's the Real Academia Española, or the Royal Spanish Academy. They publish a dictionary uh, that says what is Spanish and what isn't. And if the Real Academia doesn't approve it, it, it it's, it's bad Spanish. And that was established already, I believe, by Cervantes' day. So, Cervantes was writing in a language that had already been established and codified. Um, but, but what he does, he's very playful with the language on the other hand, because he resurrects 
the medieval Spanish in, in the archaisms in the work. So there's, it's sort of a hat tip to those who mm -hmm. came before him, you know, as much as it is a device of satire. Hmm. Uh, Stephen has a follow-up question. Uh, when I look at the um, Cervantes work as a whole and Don Quixote, I can't help but wonder if uh, there wasn't the intent to undermine chivalry as an aspect of culture uh, by subjecting it to farcical treatment to um, make it um, vulnerable to ridicule and so on and so forth. And when I also look at, too, that uh, the main character is an old knight, it kind of implies that the concept of chivalry itself is kind of old and perhaps uh, mildly insane or outdated. You know, has anyone viewed the work from that perspective? I, I you know... I, I don't want to say yes or no. I, I, nothing I've come across has given quite that reading to it. But I, I agree with you in that Cervantes was criticizing the, the view of chivalry in not chivalry itself. Um, he, he doesn't say anything about whether it had a proper time and place. But what I think he's instead saying is in, in the real world, of the the current day of the then current day uh acting according to these values of chivalry was setting yourself up for disaster uh and then writ large that's what the spain of his day was essentially doing um but yeah i um that's an interesting question i i would uh I'd like to give that some more thought. Maybe I'll write an essay about it, but yeah, that's, I'll leave the answer open-ended on that. Okay, thanks. I look forward to reading it. Sorry, sorry, I didn't have anything more definite for you. <laughs> well, if anybody had a burning thought in their chest, now would be the time, your last chance to get it out. Oh wait, I just saw something pop up in the chat box. Aha, okay, Nazgat, just in time. Go for it. You you would be on mute, Nazgat, so you have to take yourself off mute. Oh, I'm off mute. Hi, hi Adam, great, great, uh, great uh, lecture uh, presentation. I uh, just had a question regarding, uh, I think you mentioned Roderick and what happened mm -hmm. with his daughter, Florinda. I've heard that before as well in a, a, an old uh, lecture series as well. Uh, I was just wondering if you personally ever got a chance to do any research on that to see if that, that was actually accurate. Uh, I know you mentioned that that uh, story was carried through to the plays and stuff, but, uh, but I just wanted to know if there's actually any uh, evidence or anything like that. Yeah, what, everything I've come across has said there's no evidence for it, but there's really nothing saying it didn't happen either. So, you know, oh, it's wow. just confined to the realm of myth. You know, it's you know, it, it could very well have happened. It's certainly believable. Yeah, I was thinking that's a, a valid reason why a father would have uh, enemy forces to come in and exactly. do what he did. Yeah, so, okay, thank you. Sure. Okay, last chance for takers. Okay, I have a request um, for Pascal before we close it up for today. I'm next week. I think this sets the, the stage really nicely for a continuation around the same time uh, frame, um, but in a different geographical location from somebody who is, I think, in many ways a kindred spirit of Cervantes uh, named Rabelais who we'll learn about next week. And Pascal will be uh, the person delivering that lecture. And I was hoping, Pascal, you might want to give people a bit of a, a quick teaser intro of the uh, some of what they might be expected to, uh, to encounter next week uh, in next week's lecture. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, so I'm going to try not to repeat what uh, Adam just said uh, so eloquently. I'll try to uh, 
not overlap so that people who haven't seen Adam's uh, presentation will go in and check it out. Um, but yes, I'm going to be uh, focusing much more on uh, the situation on the other side of the Pyrenees, so uh, in France of the time, uh, talking about Chablé was uh, really a, an astonishing uh, uh, person, uh, really a, a Renaissance man um, of, of his age. And uh, yeah, we're going to try to discuss um, Basically, you know, his, his works, which are about giants accomplishing different things uh, in the realm of France at the time, um, and trying to figure out if it really, you know, what, what is true and what is not in, uh, in, this, uh, in this world of giants that have to deal with different strange things uh, in, in, in this age of religious warfare. So as everyone, I, I hope that you can extend this invitation as well to uh, your truth-loving, idea-loving friends and family members in this time where I think fear and confusion is running very high. Ideas and substance are at a premium, so we really want to make this contagious, this love and pursuit of great literature, classical ideas, and their application in the form of the betterment of the human condition. So... Um, I hope to see everybody next week. Also, as, as a side note, this Tuesday, Martin Seif will be gracing us with the first of two presentations on another component of universal history from something a little bit more recent in time, uh, specifically the reasons for the assassinations of Tsar Alexander II and McKinley, both run by the Anarchist International uh, that had a certain um, moment in London in 1881 where the Anarchist International came together for a conference that is, has largely been obscured and written out of proper history books. Um, but without such an understanding, it would be very difficult to discover, understand what is it, what techniques have been utilized to destabilize nation states and cultures from embodying the type of Renaissance conditions that is our natural happy state. So that'll be this Tuesday um, at, not, at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, Adam, thank you enormously for sharing your bountiful experience and wisdom from so many different levels of thinking. I, I just appreciated that on, on so many levels. So thank you. It was you. my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us today. And uh, see, see you all hopefully Tuesday or, and or Sunday. Bye, everyone. Take care. Bye. Bye.